why am I bringing up the Soviet Union? Because its successor state, the Russian Federation, appears to be following the exact same path that led to the Soviet Union's demise. Putin has managed to establish himself public enemy number one to the point that I'm sure you haven't given much thought to Kim Jong-un this year, have you? What's interesting is that the same element that propelled the Soviet Union to glory appears to be the catalyst that will pull Russia down. What am I talking about, my friends? Oil and gas are the commodities that are driving Russia into a crisis. We need to understand what makes Russia tick, and as you watch this video, you will see how the oil crisis has turned into an economic and foreign policy disaster. One could argue that the basis of most, if not all, of Russia's troubles is the oil and energy crises, so let's go a little further. Russia, as a state, inherited a lot from the Soviet Union, most notably the Soviet Union's energy superiority, which included many pipelines and large oil and gas resources that were part of Soviet territory. This gave an advantage in continuing to dominate the energy field that the Soviets had dominated, and Russia has dominated the energy fields globally since then. Putin has referred to Russia as a global energy giant, which is wholly legitimate. Russia is a worldwide energy force to be reckoned with. It is one of the top three oil producers, competing with Saudi Arabia and the United States for first place in 2021. Russian crude and condensate output hit 10.5 million barrels per day, accounting for 14% of global supply. Russian crude and condensate output hit 10.5 million barrels per day, accounting for 14% of global supply. Russia is the world's second largest natural gas producer behind the United States, and it boasts the world's greatest gas reserves. It is also the world's greatest gas exporter, with much of its output going to China and Europe, with Russia serving as Europe's primary supplier. In fact, the EU depends on Russia for 45% of its imports and about 40% of its consumption, implying that Europe is very reliant on Russia for both energy and money. This is where the problems begin, and the similarities to the Soviet Union indicate that Russia is just too reliant on oil and gas, which causes a variety of issues despite having the resources. Russia has not taken the time to diversify its economy in the way that the Saudis did when they discovered oil. Instead, Russia's economy has centered around oil and gas, and because they have so much of it, their over-reliance on fossil resource exports threatens the nation's GDP and domestic expenditure. Every time oil prices fall or its exporters lose market share, their income swings, so to put it simply, petroleum are the focus of modern Russia, no surprise the late Senator McCain referred to them as a gas station masquerading as a country. When it comes to revenues, oil and gas account for 60% of the country's exports and 45% of its budget revenues. Their oil has ranged from 15 to 25% of the Federation's GDP, with approximately half of all shipped to Europe and the majority sold in Asia. This brings me back to what I mentioned earlier. Europe is heavily reliant on Russian supply, but Russia is overly reliant on European money. I mean, how can they not be when commodities account for 60% of the country's exports and 45% of the national budget? This over-reliance on a single industry is harming Russia and has progressed to the point that it may be the cause for the country's demise. One of the drawbacks of being overly reliant on the energy sector, as the Soviets discovered the hard way, is that oil prices are volatile. For example, low oil prices throughout much of the 2010s harmed Russia's oil profits, which harmed the country's own plans and finances given how reliant they are on other high-producing countries such as the United States and Saudi Arabia. They are, to some extent, victims of the same dilemma, but they have other industries bolstering their nations, providing massive capital to expand production even during high oil price years. Something that Russia simply cannot achieve, and to be clear, it is not just the economic atmosphere around oil. A significant chunk of Russia's oil and gas crisis derives from their refusal to innovate when Putin took office in 2000. Because of the surge in oil prices, Russia's revenue increased, which may have contributed to Putin's ascension to power. Despite having so much money, Russia did not innovate, and there are still few incentives for businesses to create new industries. Because of the high expense of developing new fields, Russian oil production is primarily reliant on inefficient water pressure extraction in Soviet legacy reservoirs. Yes, they are still employing Soviet-era practices. Furthermore, two-thirds of new reserves contain unconventional oil, which requires new technology and significant capital expenditure to extract. As a result, Russian manufacturing systems have grown at a far slower pace than their rivals. Now, this is not usually a disastrous disaster because many countries have tremendous resources but are unable to exploit them.
As we've seen in numerous occasions, these countries just signed various contracts with foreign oil companies. Russia, on the other hand, is significantly different due to Russia's high tax rates, unstable regulatory framework, and official suspicion of international enterprises, particularly those from the West. Russia has not been able to fully develop its Siberian fields, restricting output and revenue potential. Russia's situation is likewise unclear in a sector that relies on international contacts and good foreign policy to improve trade partnerships. Russia's militarism in Ukraine in 2014 brought U.S. sanctions to their doorstep, further crippling the country's oil revenues. The European Union's green energy policies have eroded Russia's advantage. After all, what is the use of possessing massive oil and gas resources if the world is heading toward clean energy? In addition to all of the issues that have been producing an energy crisis in Russia, there is the Ukraine issue, which is likely Russia's largest error. Most people make the mistake of seeing last year's invasion of Ukraine in a vacuum, it is more than just a political fight. No, there are substantial economic linkages powered by oil and gas that make Russia's already questionable invasion objectives even more horrible. Apart from Russia, you can see that of the 15 or so states that emerged from the Soviet Union. Ukraine was the one with the most significance, not only because it has a big population, but also because it inherited oil and gas infrastructure, which is important because Russia need parts of these pipelines to carry its resources to Europe. As a result, Ukraine has always been critical to Russian export goals. The magnitude of that is determined solely by whether the current Ukrainian government is pro-Russian or pro-Western. Having a pipeline hub in Ukraine on which Russia relies is something that Putin and his leadership have never been particularly fond of over the years. Ukraine has had a number of disagreements with Russia over transit payments owing for the use of Ukraine's hub for exports to Europe, and this has become a cause of friction, further escalating relations between the two countries. Ukraine's strategic significance in controlling Europe's gas hub, as well as its historical geographic importance during the Soviet era, means that price conflicts have also been geopolitical. However, a detailed examination reveals that the country has had economic difficulties right before disagreements with Ukraine in 2006, 2009, and 2014. Let's take a look at each of these conflicts with Ukraine one by one. In April 2005, Putin abruptly demanded a more than threefold increase in gas costs from Ukraine, an unacceptable measure that resulted in Russia reducing gas delivery to Ukraine's hub in 2006. In January 2009, the system had three days of low pressure, reducing flow to numerous European countries. Putin also turned off Russia's gas supplies for 12 days, leaving millions of people in seven European countries without heat. The negotiations were once again mediated by EU negotiators. Putin's timing was not coincidental, it corresponded with the low point of the 2008 financial and oil price meltdown, which triggered a severe slump in Russia's domestic economy. The most severe of these disputes occurred in 2014, when a pro-Russian president was overthrown by popular vote. Putin's forces annexed Crimea and supplied ammunition to Russian insurgents in the Donbass region of Ukraine. Something to notice is that around that time, Crimea was believed to have major offshore gas resources, selling their oil and gas to Europe would undercut Russia's business by tens of billions of dollars, which Russia definitely did not want. I'm not saying they invaded Crimea solely for their gas fields, but it's quite a coincidence that they invaded the place with massive Ukrainian gas fields at a time when Ukrainian politicians were exploiting their offshore reserves as a way to phase out reliance on Russian gas imports. I'm not claiming they invaded Crimea for its gas fields, but it's a coincidence that they invaded the place with enormous Ukrainian gas resources at a time when Ukrainian leaders were leveraging their offshore reserves to phase out Russian gas imports. After the 2009 gas dispute, the international community took note and penalized Russia. The EU began to challenge Putin's fossil supremacy with a series of legislative and judicial moves that limited Russia's leverage in European oil and gas sales. Essentially, they intended to limit Russia's authority in the energy sector because Putin was misusing it every time he threw a temper tantrum. Essentially, they intended to limit Russia's authority in the energy sector because Putin was misusing it every time he threw a temper tantrum. One rule known as unbundling, which prohibits the same corporation from having a monopoly on both energy infrastructure and fuel, specifically targeted Gazprom. This one rule was observed Gazprom, Russia's largest state-owned international energy giant, was severely penalized after several antitrust raids on Gazprom headquarters in 10 EU nations in September 2011. Gazprom was then charged with unfair pricing tactics against weak countries such as Bulgaria and Poland. 
many of these, particularly green regulations that would effectively limit payments and imports from Russia in favor of 100% clean energy, have enraged Moscow. These would have a negative impact on the revenues of Russian aluminum and steel exports, which have substantial carbon footprints. Remember how I mentioned that Europe is a significant Russian consumer and that hydrocarbons contribute for 45% of Russia's budget? Yeah, that jeopardizes that. All of this probably encouraged Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but it also fostered the EU's hate of Russia. The EU has sanctioned everything Russian, and each member state has already begun to phase out Russian oil and gas. This means that, while it may not appear to be the case right now, Russia is in serious danger. Just because Europe is suffering as a result of Russian retaliation does not mean that Russia is not suffering as well. We are approaching a stage where Russian revenues will be substantially reduced, and the country may be compelled to rely only on Asian markets. Europe is sick of being intimidated, and by invading Ukraine, they have demonstrated that. Russia has committed a heinous crime, one that will very certainly cost them their economic life in the absence of European markets. Russian revenue will fall. This will have a significant impact on nearly half of all Russian budget money, causing serious domestic issues. The recently agreed upon cap of $60 a barrel is intended to provide Russia with an incentive to continue pumping oil, contributing to global supply while preventing windfall profits from going to war in Ukraine. This policy lets importers of Russian oil to benefit from Western shipping financing and insurance only if they pay at or less the 60 price. Basically, Russia's teeth are being cut off. Remember when the Soviet Union collapsed? Yeah, that looked a lot like what's happening now. We may be approaching a day when we see Russia being phased out and cut off from the international community. And when that happens, remember that it all started with an oil and gas crisis. Subscribe for more informative videos from us.